Today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to be finishing up that chapter. And uh, I've titled today's message, It's Time to Grow Up. If you've ever been in a conversation that all of a sudden it switches topic, you know that if you're not paying attention, the sudden change can completely throw you off. I know this has happened to me, and maybe it's happened to you as well. By listening carefully to what's being said, in that group conversation, in that, or maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you'll be able to, to grasp what that new topic is and be able to adjust to the conversation's new direction. You won't be thrown off. You won't be confused. This, again, will keep you from saying those embarrassing words. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought you were still talking about that other thing. Well, last week, I purposely stopped in verse 10 because this is what the author of Hebrews does in this passage that we're going to be covering today. He suddenly changes the topic. When we ended there in verse 10, it seems as though he really wants to share some deeper insights into the reasons why Jesus is a superior high priest. It almost seems like he wants to be like, oh, I want to just share more about this topic. And you can just almost feel it just with the words that he's saying. But then he stops and he thinks about it and he realizes that he's not sure whether or not his readers are, re are ready for what he wants to teach about, wants to share with him. And so in this week's passage, we're going to see how he suddenly breaks off topic and turns to confront his audience, his readers, directly with the problem of their spiritual immaturity. In verses 11 through 14, he will rebuke and exhort his readers in a way that only a loving spiritual father could. He's going to do this by first telling them what the problem is. He then will point out the cause of the problem. And then lastly, inform them what they need in order to fix the problem. Now, if you're sitting here today, this morning, or watching this message, and you're wondering, you know, am I growing in the faith? Am I spiritually mature? Am I becoming more mature? Or if you've been a believer for a long time, and you just maybe have stopped reading your Bible, and you're not, you know, you're just kind of in limbo, and you're not really doing it, you're not really growing, you're just stagnant. Well, this message will encourage you, but it'll also warn you about the dangers of spiritual immaturity. You see, what you're going to learn here is that we must steadily pursue maturity in the faith by digesting the deep truths of God. So that what the author is saying to everyone here. What he's saying is that he's telling the people he's writing to and to immature believers today is that it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. So before we start reading, let's pray and seek the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for bringing us all here, Lord, and we know that everyone's dealing with different things, different issues, situations, Lord, um, some good, some bad, Lord, and I pray that you 
right now, this moment, that you will give them comfort, Lord, you give them peace, that you will give them some words, Lord, that will speak directly to them, and they will know that it comes from you, Lord. We want to grow, we want to mature, we want to become more like your son. So, Lord, we ask you to fill this room with your spirit. Speak powerfully to our hearts today. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. The word of God says, We have a great deal to say about this. And it, it is difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. I'll stop there for now. In verse 11, the author confronts the reader by telling them why he can't get into the deeper aspects of Jesus' priestly ministry. They had become, become too lazy to understand. They didn't have the mature years minds or hearts to grasp what he knew would be difficult to explain. Why? Because those who are trained in Scripture and progressing in the faith would be better equipped to understand Christ's priesthood. Whereas those who had shut their ears to God's Word and regressed in their faith would have a hard time following along. You see, one of the signs of spiritual immaturity is not making the effort to read, study, and act on what the scriptures say. But the mark of someone who is spiritually mature is their energy to investigate and understand spiritual concepts that are hard to explain. Now, let me give you an example of this. You know, I, I was never a math person. I, in high school, I hated math. Even in college, I hated it, didn't like it. Maybe some of you like it a lot. Maybe it's your favorite subject. But when you're taking, if you've ever taken a calculus course, that instructor there or that teacher assumes that you already have the basic concepts of algebra and, and geometry. But if you're in that classroom without knowing how to do a, sim <clears throat> a simple algebraic expression, you're going to be lost as soon as that teacher hits that, that board. You have to understand certain things, certain principles, you know, to, to really understand the higher levels, or, or else it's just going to go over your head. Likewise, as believers, we have a moral responsibility to know and to understand Scripture, and at the very minimum, the basic concepts of your faith. Now, even though there are times that God reveals certain truths to us in His timing and in His way, we can't always blame God for our willful ignorance of not knowing biblical truths and concepts, basic ones. When God commanded us not to commit adultery, it's your fault, not His, 
from not knowing that Jesus clearly explained the true meaning of what adultery is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28, where he said that pretty much that adultery begins in the heart. And you lust after a woman. The truth is, Scripture teaches us that our ignorance of God's Word is a moral problem, not an intellectual one. When we deliberately ignore God's Word for whatever reason, we're actually sinning against the Lord. You see, becoming lazy to understand is a problem with the heart. And it shows that we're not really interested in what God has to say. And when we don't want to hear what the Word of God says, it says a lot about our lack of maturity or the lack of a spiritual maturity. So in the case of the Hebrews, the congregation had become intellectually sluggish by their own negligence. Their spiritual immaturity was their fault because they became sluggish, lazy of the heart. And because their hearts became indifferent, and because uh, their hearts became indifferent to Scripture, the author knew they weren't ready to understand. They wouldn't understand the deeper truths that he wanted to share with them about Jesus' prince, priestly, priestly ministry. This passage here calls to mind the author's previous exhortation in, back in chapter 2, verse 1, to pay attention all the more to what we have heard. So after having explained what the problem is in verse, in verse 12, the author uh, more acutely pinpoints the root cause of the problem. Not only can they not understand spiritual concepts of Christ's priesthood, but they had also forgotten the fundamental things of the faith. Although they had plenty of time to be, um, become teachers themselves, they actually needed teachers to reteach them the basic principles of the Christian faith. This particular reference to teachers isn't referring to those who hold a particular teaching office, such as a pastor or an elder or a, even a Sunday school teacher. Rather, by using the term teacher, the author is is addressing their responsibility to disciple other believers. And in case you didn't know, in case you were wondering, not all Christians are expected to become pastors and elders. All Christians, however, are expected to be teachers in a sense that they should be prepared to train new believers in the fundamentals of the faith. If you consider yourself a mature believer here today, you know, as you need to think about maybe discipling a newer believer. They need you. And this is part of your calling as well as, as, as a Christian. You can show them what the Lord has shown you, maybe through your studies and your um, experiences. And it doesn't have to be on a stage. It could be on a one-on-one -on -one level. You know, just hanging out at a park, having lunch, taking your Bible with you. But discipling is important. That's your role. You're ex that's what you are expected to be teachers in that sense. This church should consist of willing and mature disciples who are training up newer and less developed disciples. And so what I want to do here in this church is make sure that everyone here has a good understanding of what the Bible says so that you can share this information to newer believers.
So again, be disciplers. Well, again, because of their spiritual deficiency, he tells them they need others to teach them the basic principles of God's revelation again. The word again is critical here because it indicates that the church didn't internalize the teachings that they already received. It's not as if they needed to be taught for the first time. They've already been taught those basic, they've already been taught what those basic principles were. The word again actually implies that the church had forgotten what they should have known by heart by now. And it wasn't simply that they needed a review because again, they already knew it. And this is important because it tells us that Christians, no matter their maturity in the faith, they should always look back and review the elementary things of the faith. The church, though, that the writer is saying this to, they need more than just a recap. They needed to relearn everything. Thus, for us, we must be careful to internalize, we, we must be careful to internalize the teachings we receive and to take the fundamentals of the faith to heart so that we're established in the faith and be able to fulfill our responsibility as teachers and as disciples. The issue the author addresses here is the Christian's intellectual responsibility. But we must not limit this particular warning to only the, to the Christian's intellect. It's ultimately about the entirety of the Christian's spiritual life. Our spiritual life should be such that we're learning to take responsibility for our own growth. We must be, we must be developing an appetite for grace, knowledge, and understanding. Are you hungry for those things? Do you really, do you find yourself waking up every morning and, oh, I need more grace. I need more truth. I need more knowledge. It should be. It sh you should yearn for those things. See, the more we know, the more you know, the more you should want to learn. We're called to do this not only for ourselves, but so that we can teach those who are, again, less spiritually mature. See, our spiritual growth has both inward and outward dimensions. We grow in the faith for our own, for our own sake and for the sake of others. This text also teaches another important truth about the Christian life. Certain fundamental principles and doctrinal foundations are prerequisites for understanding more mature, complex truths. Before we can handle the upper-level courses, we must master the entry-level classes. We must grasp the truths at basic levels before we can move forward now, what are these basic principles? Well, when we get to chapter 6, we'll be doing a deep dive into what those are into them, or what they are. But for now, it's sufficient to say that the basic principles are the truths that make up the basic storylines, the storyline of Scripture. Furthermore, by labeling these principles as God's revelation, it communicates. It tells you that Scripture is God's spoken word. It also points to God. It also points to God's self-disclosing and decisive acts in redemptive history. 
these acts, which the author lays out in uh, fuller detail uh, later in this letter, are very significant moments in the history of Israel and the church. Through these acts, God isn't just revealing truths about himself to give us a, a better understanding of who he is, but he also establishes the fundamental beliefs of our faith. Now, unfortunately, those early readers of this letter are indicted for their failure to put this revelation into practice. As a result of the spiritual laziness, they remain infants in the faith. Their digestive systems can only handle spiritual milk, not solid food. In this verse and in the next, the writer of Hebrews is speaking pastorally. We might even say that he's speaking paternally. What ought to have been taking place in the spiritual lives of the church, it wasn't taking place. They ought to have been feasting on the solid foods of the faith, not continuing to nurse on the milk of spiritual infancy. This is why the author rebukes them in the way that he does. In the same way any parent would want to, uh, their child to start acting their age. Church, you all know that there no, there's nothing wrong with giving milk to an infant. Now, unless they're allergic, it's natural for an infant to live on a diet of milk. In fact, in, despite all our scientific and technological advancements, do you know we've never been able to develop anything that exactly resembles a mother's milk? But it, would, but it would be pointless to put a steak dinner in front of a baby. That child simply wouldn't be ready for it. They wouldn't know what to do with it. But everything is wrong with offering mother's milk when the child is ready for steak. This is why the word picture in this text is so powerful. This congregation ought to be eating spiritual steak by now, but instead they're still living on milk. Paul also uses this metaphor of milk in a similar way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And there he writes, For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it, not ready, not yet ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready. Now, a remarkable, there's a remarkable harmony between Paul's statement there and verse 13 here in our passage. It's a remarkable harmony again that exists there. Just as Paul contrasts the spirit and the flesh, the author of Hebrew contrasts those who are skilled and unskilled in a message about righteousness. See, folks, when, when we place these two texts besides each other, we learn that spiritual immaturity leads to moral immaturity. Spiritual immaturity leads to believers who, uh, who live according to the flesh rather than the spirit. To willingly remain an infant in Christ makes one a person of the flesh and unfit for righteousness. Now, when he says in verse 13, the message about righteousness, he essentially means the message that leads to salvation. While there's a moral element to this message about righteousness, the context of 
points us toward the gospel and God's saving purpose. It starts to become clear that believers who are childish will have a hard time sharing the gospel because they lack the ability to turn to Scripture. They'll have trouble seeing for themselves how God's plan to save culminates in the priestly work of Christ. And they'll lack the maturity to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Therefore, as born-again believers, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, we mustn't be ignorant about the gospel. Nor are we to be untutored in the scriptures. Do you know the basic the basics about the gospel? It doesn't have to be long and elaborate. But do you just know how to just share the basics about it? You should. And if not, then maybe again we ought to find someone to disciple you. And that's okay. Again, don't be embarrassed about those things. Oh, yeah. These are important matters that you need to know and understand before you can continue to grow and mature in the faith. We're called to be skilled in the message about righteousness and to walk in the ways that have been taught. Friends, if the writer of Hebrews were merely making a diagnosis, then those who are spiritually immature would have, would have little hope of remedying their situation. But he states that it's the believer's responsibility to become spiritual mature, spiritually mature. He urges his readers in verse 13 to leave behind the milk of spiritual infancy and to draw near to God feasting on the solid food of spiritual maturity. The moral imperative serves as good news because it implies that spiritual maturity is quite possible in the life of a believer. And because it's possible, we cannot persist on a diet of milk when God offers us solid food. You can't grow, what I'm saying here, you can't grow and mature in a faith and just rely on milk. You need that solid food. Don't persist on a diet of milk. Let me read that last verse and move on to, and then again, I'll sum everything up at the end here. Hebrews chapter five, verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Here in verse 14, the writer of Hebrews states now what is needed to fix the problem of spiritual immaturity, solid food. This is what distinguishes mature and immature believers. Again, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul refers to the meat of the faith as solid food. Food that required, requires the hard work of chewing and digesting. And so with that in mind, the writer is basically saying that by faithfully and diligently studying the scriptures, can a believer rightly train and exercise their spiritual power of knowing the difference between good and evil? In other words, only mature, those who understand the teachings about righteousness and who practice it, will be able to make discerning judgment on the continual moral issues that come up in life. 
And so what about the immature? Can't they tell the differences, the difference between good and evil? Well, yeah, they can on, the, on a worldly, superficial level. But spiritually, the mature, the immature are too weak because they haven't had enough practice. Distinguishing between good and evil or discernment is critical in our lives. It's vital. And it often takes shapes in ways that don't seem to make any sense to anybody. Now, if you don't know what this what the sermon is, and you've always been one, if you've always wondered if you if you have it, and as a believer, if you you know, because because it is a gift, but you never really understood what that was. Again, pay close attention because this may help you understand discernment just a little bit better. But as I just mentioned, it's critical in our lives. It takes shapes. It takes shape when when. Uh, it doesn't seem to make sense to anybody else. Now think about it. We make many of our day-to-day -day decisions on the, basis of, on the basis of intuitive discernment. Think of this discernment as like a theological grid or a worldview that helps us make instant moral and theological judgments about our circumstances. Discernment is what helps us make instant decisions when we're at a moral crossroads. Without it, we'd never get anything done. And we'd probably base all our decisions on what Google says. We'd probably be standing there at the crossroads, Googling, ah, what should I do, Google? What should I do, Siri? You know, looking it up online. For example, again, what would you think if a heart surgeon stopped and just, uh, and just began to think about his entire medical, medical training in the middle of surgery? Imagine how disastrous it would be if he needed to look at a website or at an app right before he entered the operating room. I think all of you would agree that none of us would really want that kind of surgeon. We want a surgeon who can use the intuition that they, had, they have developed over the years and years of dedicated practice. Well, this need for discernment applies not only to surgeons, but also to Christians. Discernment is a higher order of thinking and can only be acquired through diligent training and experience. We want surgeons whose powers of discernment have been trained by constant practice. Similarly, we want to mature as Christians if we want to mature as Christians, we must train our powers of discernment by constant practice. See, our spiritual perceptions are they're taxed daily. But a righteous life that regularly feeds on the solid food of God's word will be able to exercise mature judgment between what's good and what's evil. Because the righteous are not lazy to understand, they hear God's voice. They listen with enthusiasm, the same enthusiasm they had when they first came to Christ. And as Jesus promised, more truth is then given to them. Mature believers, when this happens, mature believers are huge blessings to their families, to their friends, to their places of employment, to their classrooms, and also here among us in the church. See, a lot of times they save their loved ones from pitfalls.
because they're words. The words that come from Scripture, from the Word of God, are words of life. Now, this also doesn't mean that Christians eventually reach the point where they no longer need to study Scripture. As Christians, even maturing ones will always need the Bible. Even if you've memorized this entire book in your mind, in your head, you still need to read it. You still need to study it. Discernment simply means that we find ourselves in familiar territory when we open the Word of God. Discernment means the Bible doesn't disorient us. We know how to read, study, understand, and reason from the Scriptures. When Christians possess discernment, they can distinguish between good and evil. And they have the capacity for spiritual reasoning. They can see how one doctrine relates to another and can logically apply those doctrines to aid decisions to, to aid decision making in all their all the areas of their of their Christian life. Church, a desire to grow is the most natural thing in the world. Because of it, the child one day takes his or her thumb out of his or her mouth and says, I'm not a baby anymore. Thus, the desire to grow is part of life. When we observe someone who has had his physical or mental, mental growth inhibited, it, it, it saddens us. We're bummed out. But how much more proper and beneficial for us if we would be, it would be if we could see stunted spiritual growth when it becomes what it was meant to be. Friends, church, spiritual maturity, being full grown is possible if we simply take God's word seriously. By listening, uh, by listening with all that we have, by becoming fully acquainted with its, with its teaching about righteousness and living it out, and by constantly applying God's word to the decisions of life. So as I begin to conclude here, this passage here indicts any Christians who are spiritually regressing when they should be growing. There's a great, uh, there is a great and eternal peril in spiritual infancy for it puts one in danger of falling away from God. Therefore, the author, again, and while he also teaches, while he also explained here the problem, the root of the problem and the solution, what uh, you need in order to fix the problem, the author here teaches Christians two important lessons about our responsibility to mature in the faith. Number one, it's an individual's, it's, it's an individual believer's responsibility to grow in spiritual understanding so that the congregation as a whole is better equipped to faithfully minister the gospel to those in need. And number two, it's the church's responsibility to teach the individual believer. Now, sadly, many congreg congregations, many churches drink nothing but milk because all of uh, its pastors, 
That's all their, those pastors are, are feeding them. Now, if, again, you believe that that's all I'm feeding you, I understand. I get it. You know, maybe there is other churches out there that will give you, teach you deeper things than what I'm teaching you. But if you believe, again, that you are getting solid food here, which I strive to do on a weekly basis, then I hope that you are maturing and that you are growing in the faith. That you're not the same person that you were when you first came here. That you now are able to go home and study the scriptures for yourself. That you've set apart some time to read the scriptures on your own. I want to encourage you. That's my, one of my jobs too is encourage you to do these things, to obey the scriptures. Healthy Christians serving in healthy congregations, churches, are essential, are essential to spiritual maturity. The process of spiritual maturity is a long and challenging one. But the goal is to gradually move from a diet of milk to a diet of solid food. We may retain childish tendencies for a time, but we must, steadily, we must be steadily growing out of them. We must learn to mature in the faith as those who possess powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. If this is to happen, we can never stop feasting on the solid food of God's word. Are you enjoying that solid food? I hope you are, as I mentioned before. It's so, so, that steak is so good. You know, that milk was good for a time, but now I'm just really enjoying that solid food that I get from God's word. If you don't not there, you're not ready, and then yeah, just enjoy that milk too. The basics. Get those basics down. And as I mentioned, once you understand those basics, the deeper truth will start coming to you. God will start revealing things to you in his word. The stories will make a lot more sense. The principles will make a lot more sense. You'll be able to apply them. But again, that's important too, to apply what you're reading. Now, one way to really, well, the only way to really understand what the Word of God has to say, what, is, what the Word of God is saying is by having the Spirit of God living in you. And maybe if you know you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've picked up this Bible and you've started reading, and you're like, I don't understand what this is saying. Well, first of all, maybe you should get a simpler Bible other than the King James version, um, something that you'll be able to easily read and understand. But more importantly you're not going to be able to really grasp it unless you have the word of, I mean, the spirit of God living in you. You may understand it intellectually, but spiritually, it's not going to make any sense to you. And so, if that's what you desire, if that's what you want, I invite you to come to the cross and ask for forgiveness. Tell the Lord that you're a sinner and that you need him to forgive you of all your sins, and he will. He will forgive all of them, all your past, present, and future sins. He will wipe them all away. So if you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior.
So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And I now ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me. in my new born-again life. I pray this in your name. Amen. If you prayed that, let us know. We want to want to hear your story. We also maybe want to lead you in your next steps. If you need a Bible, we got Penny here. We can send one to you. If you're looking for a church here locally, we want to invite you to our church here, Fresh Vision, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, here in the corner of um, Hondo Pass and Gateway South. Um, and just, we want you to check us out. Again, no commitment or no nothing. We just, you know, we ask you to visit us. So, and come talk to me too, please. Uh, but thank you for spending time with us today. We hope you'll join us next week as we begin chapter six. Um, if again, if you have any questions about anything that uh, was mentioned here, you, know, you can leave them in the comment section there on YouTube or or on Facebook. But until next time, we love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.